All right, good. Thank you all for coming out tonight for this event. My name is Kathleen Pablo, and I'm a member of the Fairfax County, Fairfax Area League of Women Voters, and I will be your moderator this evening. Welcome to the Sully District Meet and Greet featuring candidate, our candidate for supervisor and one of the candidates for the school board. Uh, any candidate, all candidates on the ballot were invited to come this evening. Any candidate who was not able to attend was invited to send a statement to be read. Uh, we have not, to my knowledge, received any such statements. If I'm in error, please correct me. Is this? All right, I'll use my teacher voice. Does that work? <laughs> any other candidates here this evening, we will introduce you at the conclusion of this part of the meeting, the question and answer. Um, I'd like to introduce some other group organizations that co-sponsor with the League in hosting these events. You had an opportunity to meet Debbie Kilpatrick from the Fairfax County Council of PTAs. Is, and you're from uh, the Sully District Council, I believe. and. I, there must be some others. Raise your hand if you're from the Sully District Council. Uh, the American Association of University Women of Virginia. The uh, Voice of Vietnamese Americans. And the Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. All of these organizations have material on the table here that you might like to take advantage of at the conclusion of the meeting of the question and answer sessions. All are nonprofit organizations. There I go. <laughs> now I won't have to raise my voice to you, I hope. These are all nonpartisan, um, non-political entities. We are all here, our co-sponsors in the league, we are all here to help you be better informed. And, and we do ask that you keep in mind that this is a civil and orderly discussion. All of us would like to thank you ladies for attending this evening. We have Supervisor Kathy Smith. Gamara. And one of our school board candidates, Karen Keyes Gamara. I would like to give special thanks to Mr. Ben Zuhl from the Fairfax County Public Access Television Station. Those, gen those gentlemen have come to every single one of these meet and greets across the country. <laughs> They're not that good. <laughs> across the county. And they do this as volunteers, as an indication of their civic spirit and the station's determination to play a role in the civic life of the community. This recording will be uploaded, we hope, to YouTube in a couple of days, and a link to that site will be available on all of our co-sponsors' websites. There was a lot of uh, stiff opposition to our holding this event tonight. A very formidable lineup, opposition lineup with the storm and the World Series, I guess I shouldn't have reminded you, <laughs> and the debate, and the fact that this many came to ask questions and to be better informed, and then to go home and help their communities learn more about issues is a real testament to your civic um, pride and your sense of civic duty. There 
are copies of the League's What's on the Ballot and facts for voters on the table and voter 411 cards on your seats. The voter guides will be published in the Fairfax Times this coming weekend, we hope, and they can be accessed as well at vote 411. Our format this evening. As I said, everyone who's on the ballot was invited this evening to attend or to send a representative who would read a statement. Each candidate will be introduced by the moderator and will develop, de deliver a three-minute opening statement, timed introductory remarks, and then with 30-second and 15-second warnings. Would you raise your paddles and show them what it will look like? <laughs> and Susan Dill and Judy Heline from the League volunteered to be our timers this evening. And they are seated in the order in which they will appear on the ballot. And because we have but one candidate for each slot present, we'll simply alternate questions. But it will look as if I'm giving two to one and then two to the next, Ms. Smith, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Smith. We're trying very hard to be absolutely even handed. The response time to the question and answer sec uh, to the questions is two minutes. If you have not provided a question, please do so. We have members circulating with index cards. Write your question on the index card, and they'll be delivered to me during the course of the, of the question and answer session. Um, all questions should be brief, specific, and indicate whether the question is for the supervisor or the school board candidate, or both. Only one question per index cards. And then when we conclude at 8.30, there will be a 15 to 20 minute period in which you will have an opportunity to speak personally to each of the candidates and get clarification on your questions or ask a follow-up. We will, as I say, end at 8.30, and at that point we'll take just a short uh, break so that the tape can be changed in the videography. Yes. And we'll use that time to introduce any other candidates who are here. If you are a candidate for another office or in another district, please let Sidney Johnson know so that we can properly introduce you. Let us begin. And we did, would you like to, Ms. Smith, begin with your three-minute introductory statement? Sure, so this is just going to work. Uh, good evening. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this together and for letting us know months ago that this event was going to be on our agendas. I put this on my calendar months ago so I could be here because there haven't been that many opportunities to get out and talk with the community and I think it's really vital that person-to-person -person contact to answer questions and to meet people helps us be better leaders and, and help the community. So what led me to do this? I've been your school board representative since 2002. This is a great place to live. My husband and I raised our four kids here. We have a great school system, but I've also seen the changes in the community. Our population is changing. Our demographics are changing. We have had the issues with sequestration. And I really reflected on the skill set I've gained as your school board member. I have experience with a $2.6 billion budget. I have experience making those tough decisions when you have to decide which programs you can continue to afford to, pr to provide and where you need to make cuts and make changes. And I think that experience is vital to move us forward through these tough decisions. As we're a changing community, as we're aging, we have to make decisions to make this a vibrant place to live. And I want to be part of that decision making. Um, sorry, checking my notes. We also need to ensure that our schools are strong because that's why businesses and people move here because of the strong school system. 
But part of living here and having a great place to live is working on our transportation, going door to door, talking to people. That's probably the number one issue that comes up. So we have money that comes from the state to do some transportation issues. We have to be aware of what we do when we can improve intersections. I live off of Stringfellow Road. Quality of life got so much better when that road was widened. Now we can go get pizza on Friday night that we love to do. And so those quality of life issues. And also as our community ages, what, what services are we providing for seniors so they can continue to live here? I have four young adult children. It's hard for them to afford to live here. What are we going to do about affordable housing for young professionals? Having a situation where our firefighters, our police, our teachers can live in our community. There's lots of quality of life issues that we need to deal with. And I want to work with the community to come up to our decision making to ensure we keep a vibrant place to live. Um, the, I think the most important piece, though, is I am committed to working for this community, as I have shown as my work as a PTA leader and through my work on the school board. This is a full-time job. Sully District is used to having a full-time supervisor working for them. And the expectation that this job pays $95,000 a year, I am committed to working with the community, being here and having office hours, working with people on the weekends and the evenings, and working together with you to ensure it's a great place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Uh, when we get to the questions and answers, in order to pack maximum questions into the time we have, would you refrain from applause until the end? Good evening. I'd like to thank you, everyone for coming uh, on this day, that it's a great day for ducks. Um, and especially the League of Women Voters for arranging this opportunity to uh, share our views and get to know the candidates a little bit better. My name is Karen keyes Gamar, and I'm obviously running for the school board in the Sully District. And I have been endorsed by both teachers unions as well as the Washington Post, and I am here to shamelessly beg for your vote. I am uh, a mother, I have three children, and I am also an, an attorney. My husband and I, Antoine, sit, seated in the front row. We've been married for 25 years, and we have three amazing boys. I'm just a little biased, maybe. Um, my oldest son, Jonathan, is, has graduated from Fairfax County Public Schools and is attending school um, college in the local area. My middle son, James, is attending West Point, and my youngest son, Jordan, is a junior in high school and made me, made, wanted to make sure I did not say the name of that school, but it is Fairfax County Public Schools. So my work, since I came to um, Fairfax County back in 1990, um, I've done a lot of volunteer work. I've worked with a number of organizations, including the NAACP, CASA, which is a court-appointed special advocates. Um, and all of my, as I look back, hindsight is 2020, and I realize that I've pretty much always been focused on improving the lives of children and families. Currently, I work as an attorney who is appointed as a guardian ad litem, which basically means that the court appoints me to protect the best interests of children, which gives me what I consider to be a privilege to work with a number of members in the community to work on solutions for children. And I also get to interface with a number of families and work and to help the lives of children. So for example, just a few years ago, I met a six-year-old who was having some difficulty because a teacher noticed that she was, had missed 30 days of school and it was only November. I was appointed as a guardian ad litem and I discovered that she and her younger sibling uh, were trying to take care of their terminally ill mother. I was able to come together with members in the community as well, teachers, principals, social workers, psychologists, special education professionals to develop a solution for this family and eventually she was adopted after her mother passed away. Solutions is what I work for and I have come to believe in the 150 children that I have represented that education is key to their success because even if they deal with trauma and difficulty, if you can get them on the, on the path of, of good education, you've gone a long way to giving them a good foundation. I work collaboratively with a lot of folks in our community. I'd like to take those skills to the school board and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now we'll begin with questions. We'll hold applause until the very end. You will have two minutes to answer this question, or you may choose not to answer it if you prefer. And we'll begin with a question that has been posed to both candidates. What are the best ways that you could support to increase funds for our public schools in Fairfax County? Ms. Smith. So um, one of the issues that we face in Fairfax County is that we have the Dillon Rule in Virginia, so we're limited to our revenue sources. So I'm going to take part of the question to mean what can we do to bring in different forms of revenue. And one of the issues that's been talked about is a meals tax. And what would have to happen is that a referendum would go to the voters and the voters would make a choice if we wanted to have a meals tax. I think if this issue was going to come to the voters, there would have to be a serious discussion of how the revenue would be used. If Fairfax County did a meals tax at 4%, it could bring in 80 to $90 million. Every penny that gets raised on the real estate tax rate brings in about $22 million. So I think the discussion of whether we do a meals tax or not also needs to talk about would part of the revenue from the meals tax provide relief to homeowners on real estate tax. And then there would need to be a discussion in the community of what services we would provide. Would it go to schools? Would it go to public safety? What issues would you deal with that? So this is a community conversation to bring in different forms of revenue. Um, about 64% of the revenue that comes into the county is from the real estate taxes. And so I think as you look to raise the real estate taxes, you need to have a conversation with the community about the impact and the services we offer. Um, that $22 million that comes into the coffer for every penny we raise the real estate tax rate is about $50, $55 to the average homeowner. And so I need, think we need to have questions about that, but we don't have a lot of other ways to bring in revenue for the schools. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Keyes Gamora. There's a benefit and a disadvantage to coming after an experienced school board member. But I will try to find something to add to that. I do agree we need to look for alternative uh, revenue sources. Um, the school board does not have taxing authority. And I think that's appropriate because I believe in the balance of power. Um, but I also am a member of the Budget Advisory Committee on the school board, and we've been combing over the, the budget. And my opponent has uh, published that he believes there's still low-hanging fruit. I challenge him to let us know what it is, because 36 people sat in that room, and we had difficulty finding it. Um, essentially, there had been an audit, I think about a year ago, and they did make suggestions of about $10 million in improvements over a five-year period, I believe, but certainly not to the tune of the $70 million or to $100 million that we had previously been trying to find. So I do agree that we need to engage the community more significantly and, and help them to understand. And I think to a large extent, I've been knocking on a lot of doors, People do understand. I've had people come to me and say, let me know what we need to do. We need to keep our good schools. And I believe that Fairfax County really cares about who we are, our community cares, and we need to let all of us be a part of that decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for um, Ms. Keys Gamara. You spoke of solutions. Would you please identify two issues mm -hmm. in addition to finances in the school system that require solutions? And what do you propose as your solution? Well, first of all, I recognize that there are no magic bullets. There's been a lot of people working on these issues, and I don't claim to come in and wave a magic wand. This is going to take teamwork. This is going to take collaboration. This is going to take building relationships, not just with other school board members, but with the board of supervisors, because after all, they hold the purse strings. So issues that I would like to work on, well, one of my primary concerns is uh, class size as well as um, teachers' wages. Uh, we have inequities uh, where other counties are making significantly more. That's a problem. Obviously, we're going to have to resolve some of the budget issues to address that. But I have pledged to work on that because I do not want to lose our experienced teachers. I have seen uh, the results of teachers who can really plug into learning for our children. I've seen my son, my youngest son, I'm sorry, yes, my youngest son skip off the bus to tell me 
what he wanted, what he, he learned. And so I would work very hard on the board to try to figure out how to improve the wages for our teachers. Another problem that we're working on, and I think we're making some progress, is the achievement gap. The school board uh, had a work session, not this past Monday, but the previous Monday, uh, where they kind of changed gears just a little bit because they were noticing that the approach they were taking had not uh, reap the benefits and so now they're focusing more on literacy and making sure that early reading is in place and I think that's the right approach I'd like to continue to monitor that thank you thank you now we're going to begin with you on this round okay. this is a very diverse community what do you think are the first second, third steps in providing a quality education to all of the students from all of the groups that make up this diverse community? Well, like any organization, even a family, you have to constantly evaluate what you're doing. You have to be able to say, well, this may have worked 20 years ago, but is it working for our changing demographics? And so I think we have to evaluate, just as I mentioned, uh, with respect to the achievement gap, we've become, begun, uh, begun to focus more on literacy to change our tactics and support the appropriate group. So we need to evaluate constantly. You wanted to, what was the rest of the question? I'm sorry. The first, second, third steps you would take to provide that quality education. Okay to all of the students in okay. this district? Well, let me just say overall, I believe leadership begins with listening. And I would try to take some significant steps to make sure we're hearing from all sectors of our community. That includes PTAs, but it also means going to hear what folks are saying in churches and mosques and whoever is in our community, because they may have particular concerns. And so I want to make sure that we're tailoring, we're listening, and we're also evaluating as we go. Thank you. Ms. Smith, do you anticipate any effect on local streets this side of 66 as a result of the plans for tolling? Okay, so I'm not sure I totally, um, so the plans for tolling 66 on the hot lanes? Apparently. Okay. So any effect on local streets this side of 66 so the, if plans for tolling proceed? Okay. The, the plans for 66 outside of the beltway would add um, HOV lanes, but there would still be three lanes for traffic that don't get tolled. Um, so people would still have the same opportunities that they have now to travel on 66. So I don't imagine that that would change um, the routes that people take here. Um, the discussion of 66 inside the Beltway, I do believe that 66 inside the Beltway needs to be expanded. And, um, you know, there will be effect on people whether they use the roads right now. They're not allowed to if they're one person in a car, so they can't use 66. So there's definitely effect there, but people still have the option outside of the Beltway to use 66. Thank you. And number three? Your question, third question. If you could have your way and have one item excluded from the Fairfax County budget, what would it be? I should have said no gotcha questions. Wow. Um, how do you answer that question? Because you know what? One of the things I learned being a school board member, there is a constituency for all the programs you offer. And so a program that I might think we shouldn't offer anymore, there could be a constituency for. And I think that's part of leadership. Not for me to say we're going to get rid of this program, but to work with the community. Um, so we have strong libraries. We have strong parks. We want to have a strong police force. Um, so to say, OK, here's a program I've targeted and want to get rid of, I, I don't think that's responsible for me to, to make that decision. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sorry. 
for the delay, Ms. Keys Kamara. This could have been a question for both because I just received. What's the first thing you'll cut should you be elected from the school board budget? Please don't say salaries. I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading. I'm going to um, respectfully dodge that question. Um, I am a member of the board, the budget advisory committee, and my priority has been to protect resources for the classroom, and that includes salaries, um, that includes protecting the things that our teachers need to do their jobs every day. Um, and I cannot, I honestly cannot remember at this point some of the things that have come across from that committee that we want to cut. Um, you just kind of gingerly try to make sure you impact as few people as possible um, to try to make sure that our schools continue to offer the excellent education that they, they do presently and even improve. Thank you. Your second question. <laughs> If, the Fairfax, if Fairfax County proposes seriously a meals tax, will the entire underlined community support it? Should they? Will they? I haven't seen Fairfax County or any group completely agree. <laughs> That's called heaven. <laughs> No. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Ms. Smith, what do you do, propose to do to achieve a sufficient mix of housing at different price points? Um, I think it takes a combination of the supervisors working with the businesses, with developers to provide um, affordable housing. Right now there's a project that the supervisors are doing on their property with a private builder building units. They're going to be affordable apartments that firemen, police, teachers will be able to rent. I also, uh, I also think it's part of the process with um, the land use issues when you have developers coming forward that a certain percentage of their units would be affordable units when they do developments. And I think we need to look at, at spreading those things out across our communities. I've seen the impact when, when you um, have too many affordable units in certain areas of the community. And when we talk about affordable units, we're just not talking about people with the lowest wages. We're talking about affordable housing for young professionals, kids just out of college, new families. So it's a combination of units like that. Thank you. Your next question, beginning of the next round. Would you please comment on your relationship with the Sully District community organizations that advocate and support minority student achievement? So um, this is very dear to my heart. Um, I was involved with the PTAs. Um, when my kids were in school, I was the PTA president at Chantilly, uh, Poplar Tree, and Rocky Run. And I think what makes our community so vibrant is that people that live in our communities come up with solutions to help us. And there was a group that started in the Chantilly area by Shirley Nelson called Chantilly Pyramid Minority Student Achievement Committee. And these parents got together and worked together with the leadership of an, in our schools to meet the needs of kids that were struggling with their education, but also then to reward the kids that are successful. And it is a great program, and it shows the power of why this is such a great place to live, because the community members work together with the school system in this, in this um, area to help kids grow, to help them learn, and then to reward their achievements. And, you know, with other areas in, in our community, this is what makes it so strong, working with the youth sports groups. They provide fields, they help provide resources, they really work, they help keep the fields at our schools in good shape. Um, people that have passions for horses, they work together to provide trails. This is why Fairfax County is such a great place to live, um, and I have that experience working with these community groups, and I really value that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Keyes-Gamara, 
Do you foresee a continued increase in student enrollment in this district and in the county, or does it appear that it will be leveling off? Would this affect future money and facility needs, such as building of permanent classrooms? I have looked at some of the numbers, and there does appear to be a, a change in um, the number of students coming into our system. And when we plan for our capital improvements, we tend to do it in a five-year uh, block. And so that, I think, is a good plan Fair, that Fairfax County Public Schools have implemented because they can look at those changing demographics and the number of children coming in and adjust their plan accordingly. Thank you. And if I may ask, there's always talk about how much money in the school budget goes to administration, central office personnel, and so forth. What are your thoughts on this? I've heard lots of rumors. Um, I know from having been on the budget committee and also knocking on doors, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, I don't have a number in my head as to how much that is, but let's just say the rumors and the facts don't appear to match. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Please explain if you intend to support direct revenue strategies to close the operational budget gap, principally for Fairfax County Public Schools, including a property tax increase in addition to the meals tax that you've already addressed. Could you just read it once more? I wasn't sure, sure. the beginning of it. Do you support direct revenue strategies to close the operational budget gap for Fairfax County Public Schools, such as a property tax increase? You've already indicated support for the meals tax, which was the other half of the question. You know, it, and I feel disappointed for the crowd here because you came here to hear a comparison between my opponent and myself to hear our viewpoints of what we think about these issues. So I, I want to apologize that you're not getting that opportunity to hear the difference between us. Um, it is so easy to stand here and just say, we're going to find efficiencies, we're going to cut the budget, and everything's going to be great and we're going to fund what you want to have. You know, it was very interesting. I have here Mary Kim from The Connection wrote an editorial about schools funding. Uh, Jay Lark, the joint legislative, um, I always forget the order of the number, letters, joint legislative audit review committee did a report on school funding. And she references that in her editorial. And I want to read something she wrote in this editorial. Effective leaders in Northern Virginia will have to lead the way to funding effective school systems in a challenging economic environment. But if you hear a candidate claim that schools can get by on less by being more efficient, ask if they have read this report. We are past simple solutions for the services we want to provide in this community. And the answer might be that we have to raise the real estate tax rate. But one of the things I've advocated in all my years on the school board, the school board comes, school system comes out with their budget the beginning of January. The county executive comes out the beginning of February. And then the beginning of March, the supervisors will set how high the real estate tax rate can be. When they vote on that budget at the end of April, they can make the tax rate lower, but they can't go higher. And if, it, if the community wants to have a discussion about the services we want to provide, you have to provide that flexibility in where you set the tax rate. Then I would listen to the community, I would have that involvement, and see where we vote on that budget in April. But we have cut in the school system half a billion dollars. I know they've made efficiencies on the um, Board of Supervisors side, and I'm stopping. Thank you. And thank you for stopping our time. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, we did very truly invite all candidates who are appearing on the ballot. Some chose not to appear or were unable because of calendar problems, but all were then invited, if they could not be present, to send a statement that could be read by a representative. Does that? 
Yes. Let me pose the question to our supervisor. The question was, given the fact that we have but two candidates, could... No, no, no. <laughs> Miss, Miss Smith was kind enough to scrupulously stop expressing herself when the stop sign went up. Sen <laughs> to let it go a little. Thank you for that ruling. Thank you. All right. You've got an hour and 20 minutes to answer this one. That's what you get for making trouble. You, now that I read the question. I think you need that time. How does a supervisor balance transportation needs of commuters with quality of life needs of residents whose residential streets are impacted. See what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think those are part of the decisions we make when we, when we uh, plan developments, when there's changes to the comprehensive plan. There really needs to be a good look on what the impact is in communities. Um, you know, and part of that is having the plans in place, whether it's from developer proffers to improve intersections, um, to keep traffic flowing. You know, it's very hard on a community if you have cut through traffic, so I, that's part of the comprehensive plan and, and looking what you're doing with that. It's also the advocacy at the state level. Uh, VDOT, VDOT has responsibility for a lot of our roads. We've seen great improvements along 28. You know, starting to the north, it's, it's easier to travel it. You get to Route 50 and there's problems. And so, you know, that's one of the benefits of campaigning and going out to other neighborhoods that you see firsthand. Here's the, here's the trouble. I'm on Franklin Farm Road. I can't get where I need to go. So it's really looking at what solutions can we make for people in those areas, listening to people in the community about what their issues are, and being a strong advocate and bringing the community together to be a strong voice at the state level so that we have the infrastructure improvements we need. Thank you. This question will be posed to both, beginning with Ms. Keyes Gamora. According to the 2015 ACT college admissions test, only 59% of Fairfax County public school seniors are adequately prepared for college, the number varying from 75% to some schools to as low as 20 in others. Why does the percentage of prepared students vary so much? The fact of the matter is we don't know. Um, and I can't pretend that I know. I think that we are constantly looking at why we have certain impacts in one community and not in another. Obviously, you, you may have some students that have more advantages and their parents can afford to prepare them and that sort of thing. But my hope is that we can really look at what we're able to do in every community to equalize that and to be able to provide quality every, education to every child. Thank you. Ms. Smith, same question. Would you like me to read it again? Only 59% of our seniors in the county are adequately prepared for college, with the number prepared varying from 75% to 20%. In the interest of clarity, I should say that Thomas Jefferson is not in that metric. They have 99% of their students prepared. Uh, why does it vary from 75% to 20%? Why is there so much variation? So we're talking about one test, the ACT, that students take. And I think one of the real um, values and benefits I've seen over time, you used to have a situation only a few kids would take these tests. 
but really we encourage lots of kids to take these tests and that's one indicator of, of a student's ability to do stuff. I have four kids on standardized tests. They all perform differently. My boys were better at the SAT than my daughter. My daughter had better grades than the boys. Don't tell them I talked about them in public. And um, so, so those standardized tests are one indicator of what a student is able to do. A lot of our colleges aren't even using those tests as indicators anymore. You know, we work hard to prepare kids for the future. We can always work to do better. I know the experience of my kids when they went to colleges. They felt they were very well prepared compared to students from other areas. So, you know, I worry about using one indicator and saying, okay, people totally aren't prepared. And I think we have to be careful using statistics like that. This question is addressed to both candidates as well. Ms. Smith, what are your positions on the bond issues that will be on next month's ballot? I definitely support this, the school bond. Um, I think it's an important way that we uh, support building our schools, renovating our schools. The school system is behind on our, our renovations. Our policy says we will renovate a school after 25 years. We're getting up to the 35 year or sometimes more before schools get renovated and that's an, that is definitely an issue. And because Fairfax County is very careful with their AAA bond rating and the percentage of um, their debt limits, that we have a very low rate on our bonds, and you'll find that that will not affect your tax rate. So it's a good way to provide services. Um, thank you. Ms. Keyes Kamara. I agree with her. <laughs> we always need to continue to improve our buildings, and we have fallen behind in our schedule, so we certainly need to address that. I believe there's also a, a, another referendum regarding the police uh, the safety. So um, I have, I honestly haven't studied that as much as I have school issues. Um, so I would say that I need to look at that a little bit more. Thank you. This question is for both as well. So I'll start with you. All righty, you can certainly sit to answer. This questioner would appreciate a short statement from both of you about your vision for Sully District 20, 25 years down the road. What do you see coming? What do you think needs to be prepared for? I have to go first? No. Yes. Well, obviously our demographics are changing and um, my vision for Fairfax County is that we lead the nation in being able to provide, first of all, recognize what that means, but also um, improving in the achievement gap, um, closing that gap, uh, studying how to make sure that every child can take advantage of our excellent education. I expect that we will continue to have um, children leave our our schools and to compete in the world market excellently and I expect that um, we will be a rainbow of people doing that and I think that they will proudly represent Fairfax County. Thank you. Ms. Smith. I think that's one of the exciting things about coming into this yes. job and, and ensuring that we look to the future. Um, I, I think that we, ha we need to do different work with developing, that we create centers where people can live, work, and play. And I think that works for people that are getting more mature and also for young professionals. Uh, changing our hubs of employment so that we don't have to get in the car and travel far to go to work. Um, the school system has, has done things where we have a school in an office building. So as our population grows, being creative about how we provide schools, how do we combine services? Can you have a clinic in a school that the public can come in and use? Um, opening up maybe libraries and schools, really creating a vibrant place for us to live here in Sully. Um, as the population changes, we want to ensure that we keep attracting young people to come live here and, and to want to buy our houses when we decide we want to age out and move on. Um, are we going to be able to bring Metro out this way? What are we going to do with any kind of uh, bus services? Really looking at the changes we need to make moving forward. You may certainly be seated if you'd like to answer. We're going to go back to one question, one question now. Ms. Smith. 
Given that Senators Kane and Warner joined in voting against considering Senate Bill 2146, a bill that would have punished sanctuary cities, is the time ripe for Fairfax County to declare itself a sanctuary county, joining 18 large cities in refusing to help in the enforcement of federal immigration laws? In fact, uh, there's a note at the bottom, parenthetically, Fairfax County is already listed online as a sanctuary county. So, um, you know, it, it is a, a federal issue. I know from the school system, we educate every student that comes here. We want to ensure that we have um, a vibrant, safe community. I need to applaud Michael Fry for creating the Labor Center in Sully District. Um, you know, we respect the people that live here. Um, if somebody breaks the law, then we deal with that. Um, but, you know, I support us keeping a, a strong, vibrant place where we respect the people that live here. Thank you. There has been a lot of talk about cutting extracurricular programs, academy programs, voc ed programs. What is being done to protect this aspect of education? Well, I, as a member of the Budget Advisory Committee, I can tell you we had a lot of discussion about that. And we realized, I think, um, I can't speak for everybody else, but what I gleaned from that is that education needs to be a broad spectrum of experiences. And we can't eliminate music or art any more than we can English or history because we, each of these programs nurture the talent in a child who is still discovering what they can do. And I, for one, want to make sure that if we have the next uh, Maya Angelou or Robert Frost amongst our students, that we provide them with the tools to become who they are. And so I will do everything I can to make sure that those types of experiences remain available. Thank you. And to follow up, what are your plans to main for maintaining and improving the career technical education offerings all across the county in all bold high schools? Mm -hmm. Also, the prep courses in middle schools Information technology is a part of this, but this questioner is particularly looking at the skills we need in the workforce for our total community. Auto mechanics, HVAC techs, construction, electricians, bricklayers, et cetera, et cetera. One component of this is the FATE program, Foundation for Applied Education Incorporated, but more is needed as not all of our students, as we just said, are going to college. Okay, so can we summarize? Can I see that? Sure. That was a lot of question. <laughs> well, basically, it looks like they're looking for increased voc ed in the schools. Yes. Thank you. Um, certainly, all of our students don't want to go to Yale, and that's okay. Um, we need. Um, we need to make sure that we are providing uh, for a variety of skills. And I certainly support that. Um, we just ha simply have to look at how best to do that and try to make things more widely available. We do have budgetary constraints, so I can't sit here and tell you uh, that I'm going to pull out some magical money from somewhere and make that happen. But certainly, we do have an eye toward uh, making things more available in a, in a wide basis, which is, I think, kind of the trend that um, the, the board is leaning toward right now anyway, so that um, schools become more uh, attached to that community. And um, basically, everything the same things are available irrespective of what school you go to. Thank you. Once again, a question to be addressed to both Ms. Smith for 30 years, Fairfax County has struggled to close the minority student achievement gap. Do you support phonics-based reading instruction as one possible solution? You know, the, the sad part is the whole country has had trouble figuring out how to close the achievement gap. And I think we need a community solution. 
uh, to do that. Kids come to school with a gap already. And so looking at the services we provide in the community, looking at preschool, these are all important things to close the achievement gap. I was a first grade teacher. I love teaching phonics to my kids. Phonics is an important part of a comprehensive education program. And um, that's what we offer in Fairfax County. We just had a review of our reading program and there's an understanding that we need to work on some of those issues and improve them across our schools. When you have so many schools, you need continuity. But I totally believe phonics is a part of the reading program. We also need to ensure that kids have comprehension, that they know how to understand what they're reading. Um, the challenges are great. And you know, bringing in community volunteers and helping kids. I think there's a lot we can do as a community to help kids, but absolutely phonics is part of it. So let me just, the question was, do I support having phonics? Yes. Okay. Phonics-based reading instruction to well, help I close learned, the achievement. I learned with phonics, so I'm fond of it. Um, I did read the literacy audit that came out recently, and um, I think Fairfax County has taken the right approach in terms of evaluating what's being effective, what is effective and what isn't. Um, and one of the things that was pointed out in that is to make sure that our teachers have ready access to the tools to improve literacy. Uh, phonics is one of the things that's available, but I think we need to have a number of things in our toolbox to make sure that our teachers uh, have that access. I'd like to also utilize more experienced teachers to support younger teachers to say, hey, this is what worked and mentoring and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I love phonics. I did too. Another question for you now. Should Virginia adopt Common Core? And please include in your answer for those who may not have children in school what you consider to be Common Core. The short answer is no. Uh, the Common Core basically provides standards, uh, generalized standards, and we, our standards in Virginia are actually higher than the Common Core, and I think that's as it should be. We need to listen to our teachers and our educators as to what's appropriate for our schools, and I don't think we need to adopt something that um, was a fad at one point, but we're already above that. So the answer is no. Yes. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. All right. But I am going to ask you. That's fine. I'll question. sit while you ask. All right. It. Okay. What is the stat status of the independent school budget audit? Mm -hmm. Do you see whether it will provide any real additional information? Well, I know we hired an auditor, um, Auditor General, and we've had auditors in place prior to now. Um, one improvement I believe is coming down the pike is that uh, some school board members have asked that these auditors report directly to the school board, and I think that that's a good improvement. Thank you. Ms. Smith, what is the best time for interested and involved public to have an impact on the budget process, decision making on cuts, setting priorities, etc.? When should students citizens have the best opportunity to make that impact? So those of us that are elected officials know the budget process never ends. Once you stop, you start again, you have your budget forecast. So really, to be educated, you should kind of follow it the whole time and, and see what's going on. There's definitely decision points in the process. One of the things that the Board of Supervisors will be doing, and they did this um, last, I think, in fiscal year 10, is what they call the LOBS, a Lines of Business Review. And that process will start in January. They'll look at each of their, their um, lines of business, review that, get details about it, and there will be chance for the community to weigh in. And that, will, that process will take a, over a year to go through, but there will be um, time for the community to get involved. There will be community meetings. I think that's important. The school board has been looking at, at budget, budget issues, have the budget task force. We've had community meetings on the budget. As your school board representative, I think my community on the on meeting on the budget is November 17. 
um, but information will come out about that because we need feedback for the community. Um, so it is a constant process, but there are definitely different information points. I talked before about March 1st where the Board of Supervisors are going to set how high the real estate tax rate could be. Not too many citizens get involved and provide feedback about that. So there are these important decision points. There's a ton of information on the website for the schools and the county. Follow it and get involved and, and ask. You know, ask what can I say and what can I do? Because the budgets in our community need to reflect the priorities of our citizens. Thank you. Okay. We have five minutes to go. Let me reassure everyone. I have quite a thick pile of school board questions and a thicker pile for supervisor questions and still about half a dozen for both. If your question was not asked, please know that the League of Women Voters is going to submit to each candidate a list of the questions that were asked and those that were not asked. And they will be responding in writing if they choose to do so. So your question is extremely valuable and will be answered. Or in the 20 minutes, you might like to ask that question. So let me take the last couple of minutes to ask a question to both of you, beginning with, um, with you. Does implementing the Fairfax County Public Schools non-discrimination policy for gender identity require gender neutral bathrooms? No. I might get another question in. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Smith? Same question. Want me to read it again? No. 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 But, so the answer is a brief no. Got it. All right. Both candidates. One more. Since 2000, enrollment has increased in our schools 22%, but the budget's increased more than 100%. Given that revenue increased five times faster than enrollment, why was class size increased? And then. Oh, I know where the question came from. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's so easy to try to compare numbers over time and think there's connections between them. But the school system's changed. What we've offered has changed. Our demographics have changed. The programs have changed. So it's not a direct correlation between what we offer and, and comparing the budget increases that way. Um, we have needs-based staffing in the schools. I think we've done some strategic things to meet the needs of our kids. Back when I first got on the school board in 2002, a school was labeled as a high need school and it just stayed that and it got extra funding. And then we did some opened new schools and populations got changed and all of a sudden you realized now the needy population was in this school. So the school board directed our staff to look at a better way to do this and they came up with needs based staffing that puts the resources with the kids in that specific school. So we've really strategically tried to use the public's dollars in the most responsible way we can to have kids be successful. But since the economy changed in 2008 with the Great Recession, we have had some uncontrollable costs. And the revenue hasn't matched those uncontrollable costs. So we have had to do things like increase class size. When you look at the school's budget, it is almost 90% salaries and benefits. It is a people-driven business. So when you talk about finding other places to cut the budget, there's not a lot of money there. There was a previous question asking about administration. We have something called the WABY Guide, Washington Area Boards of Education Guide, that's on our website. And if you look at that and you compare the number of administrative positions we have to the rest of our employees, we're at 0.7%. Most other school districts in the area are over 1%. So we've been responsible and we're trying to meet the needs of a diverse changing population where our free and reduced kids were almost at 30%. Back in 2004, we were at about 20%. Thank you. His tape has run out. 
then we're going to give you an opportunity to answer that question. Well, I honestly have to say, everything I was thinking about was said by Kathy. Well said. <laughs> well said. Um, with respect to the numbers, sometimes you just can't compare apples to oranges, and you have to, you have to uh, adjust for inflation. And so I think sometimes I think the question itself was perhaps a little misleading, but um, I have been looking at the budget, and I'm not seeing a lot of low-hanging fruit. <laughs> this concludes the formal session of the meet and greet for this district. Mr. Velkoff. Oh, thank you for coming. Well done, Mr. Velkoff. If you would have liked to see certain candidates here this evening but did not, please tell them that you missed them. And remember to vote on November 3rd. The candidates will now be available for your questions.